my name is Hanson Su. I'm a curator here at the Computer History Museum uh, Center for Software History, and I'll be your moderator for the Xerox Park alumni panel. And on the panel today, we have Dick Lyon. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so I'll start with John. Okay, John Schock, Dick Lyon, Jim Mitchell, Dan Swinehart, Jim Rousen, and Jeff Thompson, sorry, I got you mixed up. I just met these guys. <laughs> All right, so um, I'd like to start with, uh, let's start with how every one of you uh, got to park, what we were doing before and, and how you got to park. Um, so we wanna, should we start with, should we start with you? All right. It's booting. There it is. So, um, my name's Jeff Thompson. I was uh, an engineer at Park. I had worked elsewhere in Xerox for uh, six or seven years and started at Park in 73 working for Gary Starkweather as a hardware designer. Gary is the guy who invented the laser printer. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about a little later is my use of SIL, which was the program, the front end of the set of programs for doing hardware design. Jim? Hey, my name is Jim Rousen. I was, I'm kind of the poser of this group because I was an intern and consultant at Park while I was a grad student. So what happened is, if those of you have ever heard of Carver Mead um, and you know custom chip design stuff, I was a student of Carver Mead's. And uh, as an undergrad, um, I was trying to decide whether to get a job, and Carver said, hey, how'd you like to work at this lab that Xerox has up in Palo Alto and come back and be a grad student? And uh, I managed to score an intern job up there and worked for six months, two, two summers plus part-time. <laughs> totally. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about later is writing about 20,000 lines of code uh, to build a layout editor on the Alto called Icarus in BCPL. I'm Dan Swinehart. I was at uh, Stanford AI Lab and did a thesis on, on uh, software uh, development and uh, uh, multiple process uh, user interfaces with uh, 2D screens and that sort of thing. So it was fairly natural to look to Park as a place of employment. I was originally hired to uh, work on uh, an Alto-based system uh, in conjunction with a book publishing company. Um, but the Alto was, uh, at the time I arrived, there were four of them in one room. Um, I think they had names like Goldberry and Blueberry and, and uh, um, were painted the same colors and with, with a uh, cable running across the ceiling called an Ethernet. Uh, so it took a while to, to get going on the, on the work we were hired for. So. Um, so I'm Jim Mitchell. I think I was employee number seven or eight at the computer science lab. Um, when Park started, uh, they wanted a computer science lab. They got Bob Taylor, who had run the DARPA, then ARPA, IPTO. He actually came over to the company that I and Butler Lampson and Chuck Thacker and others worked at. Um, in Berkeley called Berkeley Computer Corporation. We were building the last big time-sharing system. And those doors closed one Friday, and the next Monday, Butler and I drove over to Palo Alto and signed on with, with Xerox. The Alto wasn't the first machine we built. The first machine was actually a, a pretend PDP-10. And that was because, see, we worked for Xerox. And they wanted us to buy a Sigma something or other. Um, and we wanted to use 10x. So we decided we would build a PDP-10. That pertains to the Alto because it was that fake PDP-10, which we called Max, M-A-X-C, the C is silent, which was a joke about Max Pilevsky, who was the head of the Xerox data systems at the time, because um, he was upset about this. And 
what we did on Max that went directly into the Alto was Chuck Thacker used the first 1103 chips to make solid state memory for Max, and that same card is in there, right? Uh, and then it was about, so we used that, and we used that for a while as a 10x time sharing system, and then we gradually did that. Meanwhile, I was, I was off working to develop the Mesa programming language and stuff. The one thing we haven't seen here yet is there's a Mesa byte emulator that runs on the Alto um, uh, as well. And then later, well, I did a number of things on the Alto, but, but um, uh, the, its, its origins started at Berkeley and came to, came to park with this whole team because Berkeley Computer Corporation was too stupid to let Xerox buy us, and so the team came instead. How many times has that happened in the Valley, right? Um, one last thing, Jim Morris isn't here, but he, he was a key figure at Park. And one of the things he said about the Alto that I loved, and you've got to remember it was time-sharing systems in those days, was the nice thing about the Alto was it ran just as slowly at night as it did during the day. <laughs> right? Because if you were on time-sharing systems, you would work at night to get enough cycles to do anything. We didn't have to do that anymore. Actually, we would come in at night, but mostly we played games. I'm Dick Lyon. I was, uh, I think, a relative latecomer to the Alto. I showed up in 77 after Carver Mead introduced me to Bert Sutherland when I was fortuitously visiting at uh, Caltech one day when Bert was visiting as well. And uh, he it sort of clicked that I should go work there, so I did. I joined Lynn Conway's LSI Systems Group. Uh, we had the Icarus CAD program that Jim Rousen wrote. Uh, Altos were fully deployed. We had Ethernets and printers and CAD and all this stuff. Uh, you know, it was all working by the time I got there. So I was literally more of a user than a than a developer. Although I got to got to hack on the uh, software some, and that was a lot of fun. We'll say more about that later when we do some pictures. I'm John Sh John Schock. I um, in the late '60s, I was an undergraduate at Stanford. And I took a uh, class taught by two very unusual computer scientists, Geo Wiederhold and Alan Kay. And I was a bit of a wise guy. And at the end of that, um, Alan, who was always looking for people who would have an opinion, said, hey, what are you doing this summer? Xerox is opening a research lab. And I said, I don't know. I don't have any plans this summer. And he said, well, you want a summer job? I mean, the interview was about that long. And I went for the summer, and I stayed 14 years. And in that period, I worked on Smalltalk, I worked on the Ethernet, I worked on the PUP protocols, I worked on the IP, uh, TCP, later IP TCP with Vinsurf, um, and then went on to management and worked at corporate and did a bunch of other things. Um, I was there early enough, actually, in pre-Alto days when Max was coming up, and maybe we'll say a few words later about the Polo system that people often forget. Some of the first programs I wrote were on a Data General Nova controlling what was the research character generator uh, designed, the RCG, designed for Polos, which is where we experimented with a lot of the graphics and the UI stuff that ended up on the Alto. But we'll see if we get back to that. All right, so my next question is, uh, what was your first experience with the Alto like? So do we do we want to go down the line again, or just want to jump? In, have people jump in? Okay. Uh, my group got an Alto fairly early in the game, uh, and when they were first available, they weren't really good for much. Um, we got ours before. I think before we had any Ethernet. Uh, I was in a building across the street from the main park facility, so we didn't have any Ethernet in our building. So my first experience was to try and make it work. And the only way that you could make it work at that point in time was to go over to the big computer room where Max lived, and there was an Alto there, and you ran an Alto that had two disk drives on it. So you would go over there and take a blank disk with you and run a very early Alto program called Copy Disk and create your own disk drive so you could start off in life. So that's the way I started. 
So I, I got there in the summer of 1976, um, and I could still vividly remember when I was a senior at Caltech, a lab to me was a place with cement floors and tall desks and lots of tectronic scopes that triggered and HP scopes that didn't trigger and you know so forth. And then um, I got brought up to, to uh, interview at Xerox Park, and the place was carpeted and quiet, and everybody had a computer in their office, and it was a totally foreign experience. Don't forget uh, bag chairs. Well, yeah, the, he reminded me. And then there's the beanbag chair room where you would go to listen to talks when you weren't falling asleep, because they were always after lunch, which was a bad idea. Um, and, uh, and I can also vividly remember these discs. Everybody had a rack with about 10 or 15 discs on the side of their Alto, and they were constantly you know, swapping them in and out. Um, but the most jarring part was leaving that and going back to Caltech, where we had nothing like the Alto, and that was like really sad. Um, I wasn't going to tell this story, but given the way the question was asked, um, I, uh, after, after arriving and spending a year or so working on other things, we, I got my first Alto. And uh, um, I believe I might be the beneficiary, the first beneficiary ever of the Alto Lemon Law. Because um, uh, after s several days of trying to get anything done with the machine, and people coming in and doing various things to try to fix it. The last I saw of that machine was as a pile of boards being rolled down the hall on a, on a cart uh, with, the, with the carcass. Uh, but they brought me another one, and, and so um, we, we continued to work. Um, you've all heard the story of, uh, of Steve Jobs and his demo at Park and, and how that inspired him to work on the personal computer. Um, we were all asked to give demos to various people. My first one, I remember, I was excited to show all the flash and dazzle. And it turned out the guy was a facilities person from somewhere, and his big concern was where to put the, the, the uh, processor. <laughs> and so we spent the whole time talking about configurations, desk sizes, uh, the heights of things, <laughs> and never got anywhere close to the things we were actually interested in. So that was one of my early experiences. Um, I don't remember the first time I used an Alto. <laughs> uh, I think by 70, early 75, I know I had one in my office, and I was doing email because I was in programming language design business. We were starting to implement the Mesa bytecode interpreter for the, for, for the Alto, but I honestly don't remember the first time that I sat down at one um, and, and started really uh, programming it. Later, on an Alto 2, I implemented in firmware the disk controller for the 2314 bigger disks because we were turning it into a file server. Um, and that was, that was when I got to be a hardcore uh, Alto programmer, but even that was about 76, 77, I think. So I, I'm sorry, I just don't remember the first time I, saw, I used one. When I, when I got to Park, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I, I had, uh, when I got out of Stanford, I'd, I had been used to using computers through high school and college with punched cards and time sharing and so forth, but my first job out of uh, Stanford in 75 was at a company in the neighborhood here doing uh, space communications and so on, and our company had no computer, no access to a computer, no punched cards, no time sharing, nothing. So when I got to go to Park, I got to have a computer again, and I got to have my own computer, which was unheard of, and it worked, and I used it for everything. I mean, you know, documents, words, pictures, and, and the real job, chip design and signal processing. I could do it all on, on this one little box. You guys are making me feel really old. So my, I, I do have a clear recollection of the first, I had my first recollection, but you have to have the context of where we had come from. I mean, remember that I'd been programming an IBM mainframe in Algol with punch cards, and if you were lucky, you got an account with a 2741 you know, golf ball terminal that sped it up a little bit. If you were really lucky, you had a terminal on a PDP-10 or a time-sharing system, 
or the personal computer of that era was 16-bit mini computers that were in a rack of equipment. And if you took an assembly language programming class, you got to go in at night for an hour at one in the morning, and you had to, by hand, put in the boot sequence, which would load the paper tape, which would load the operating system, which might load your program. So you sort of come from that background. And as I said, we had the RCG system, which was a one-off, which could do graphics in a very peculiar way. And, and there had been a drawing program that had been used to create a picture of the cookie monster. And if you take two pictures of the cookie monster, one with his mouth open and one with his mouth closed, and you cycle those, you have the cookie monster chopping on a cookie. So we had the cookie monster images that had been done pre-Alto, and so Chuck Thacker and the guys were developing the Alto, and they were in the lab in what was then called the Singer Building, and I remember the first time, and they bootstrapped it over from Innova, and the first time they got the two cookie monster images pushed over onto the raw iron, and sequenced them on the display. And so you had the cookie monster eating in real time. You know? And as I said, if you'd been raised on punch cards on an IBM mainframe, this was an amazing experience. You were like on Mars. And, and then from there, it took a while until Smalltalk and BCPL and the operating system and everything else came up. But my first specific recollection of the Alto showing any bits was the cookie monster chomping away. <laughs> All right. So. Um, my next question is either if you were an engineer who did something, who worked on the Alto, um, some of you have already gone into that, but um, maybe go into more detail on what things you worked on, what you contributed to the Alto, or if you were a user of the Alto uh, doing software, interesting software, talk about that work. Well, I, I used uh, the Alto as a design tool. Uh, it was mentioned in the previous presentation that the CRT uh, was chosen because it emulated a sheet of paper. And Xerox was very much a document company. And most of the things that we were doing at Park and a great deal of what went on um, within Xerox later in the game was bringing the paper procedures of the office to an electronic format. But it was still very document oriented. The product was either a printed piece of paper or their equivalent of that in the virtual form. What we have today is a PDF. And so that was the context for everything. Um, so. My job was hardware design, and I got to use the wonderful tool that they had built as part of a suite of tools to actually design digital hardware. Uh, the, and that suite came in something that was modeled after software design. When you, when you do software, for machine code, you have an editor, an assembler, a binder, and a loader. We had equivalents to each of those steps. The editor was something called SIL, Simple Illustrator, and I'll talk about that a little more in a minute. And then <clears throat> there was the next program, which was called Analyze, and then Route, and then Build. So. SIL helped you create a document that describes some circuitry. Analyze picked that file apart and produced a netlist. Build took the netlist from many pages, because you had a SIL file for every single piece of paper, and combined it into what it took for a circuit board. And then we gave it to a wonderful woman by the name of Rosemary Atkinson, who was known as Welder Woman, and she stitch welded it up into a real board that you could load, and you had a circuit card. And you could turn one of those things around in a day. You could, you could, uh, you had all the pages of your design, and you would come in one morning, and you would <clears throat> run the build system and chunk it out and send the file over to Rosemary and take her over a blank board and she would give you uh, a wired board back 
by the middle of the afternoon and you would load the ICs in it and you were ready to, to try it the next day. It was a wonderful system. In particular, uh, Syl was a wonderfully simple editor and it pains me mightily that I haven't seen anything as good as it since. Uh, can we uh, put up some slides? Oh, yeah. So if, if you could put my PDF up, which as soon as we get a password in here. But yeah. unfortunately, Has anybody the, uh, got a password. Things been password protected. The, the <laughs> it fell asleep again. <laughs> the beauty of Sill was how little it did. It only drew horizontal and vertical lines and did text strings. So you pointed it someplace, and you pointed someplace else, and it drew a horizontal or vertical line between the two points. Or you pointed it someplace and started typing, and then it put a text string right there, and then when you hit carriage return, that was done. So the objects that you had were lines and text strings. And it turns out that's, that's almost all you need to do almost anything. The one other trick it, it had was that you could build macros. That is, you could take a set of things that you drew and you could learn those and make those a character in one of the fonts. <clears throat> Okay. There we go. So that's, that's the cheat sheet for SIL. And it, and it looks complicated, but it, but it isn't really. If you look at where it says the mouse, here, here. and you look at the right-hand side, okay, you look at almost everything you can do. You have two hands, one that, that manipulates a few keys, the shift key and the control key, and then about somewhere between two and four character keys, uh, B, C, D, and X were the, the ones that you use the most. The long list that's below there where it says commands, control characters, and it goes down off the edge of the page, shows you everything you can do, but you really only use a very few of those. So you're doing things with two hands, you're running control and shift, and then you're using the three mouse buttons. And it was blazingly fast and terrifically simple, and it only did what you told it to. It didn't have any of the Microsoft magic of, oh, we think you want to do something like this, so we will do it for you, and you spend 80% of your time undoing the magic. So I'm still looking for an editor in contemporary uh, software that will do as little as Syl did. <laughs> um, so I guess the one other thing I have to, to talk about within the culture of <clears throat> what we did Dan took, talked a little about the reliability of his machine and he got to invoke the Lemon Law. We had wonderful support. And for very early machines, they were actually very reliable. But they had two things wrong with them. One, they had early semiconductor memory. And early semiconductor memory wasn't very good. But when you weren't running the machine, it would run a memory test program, which reported over the net. So it was not at all uncommon. You would come into work in the morning, and there would be one of the tech guys who was replacing a memory chip in your machine because it had started to report soft errors. And they stayed ahead of the game on that. The other thing that was not very reliable until Mr. Lyon did the optical version was the mouse. 
The mouse worked very well when you got it. But after a while, it would crud up because it had mechanical shaft encoders and it would pick up dirt from the desktop and it would gum up inside. Well, the way we fixed that was you walk down the hall to the room where the maintenance guys were and you put your mouse in a box that said dead mice and you picked a mouse up out of a box that said live mice and you fixed it yourself. <laughs> one, one minor thing about that memory test program was that while it was running, there was a little white square that was going to random locations around the screen, which I believe was the very first screensaver. Right? So, <laughs> and that was actually the cursor that was just configured as a white square and was bouncing around. So I worked on Icarus, um, which was, uh, as I said, about 20,000 lines of BCPL code. Um, I don't have any pictures, so. But it was actually um, inspired a lot by SIL. So when I first got there, uh, I, w I went over, was sent over to talk to Chuck Thacker, which was a little bit intimidating. <laughs> He's the one that built the Alto, and he had written the original SIL. And uh, he gave me, you know, well, not just a pep talk, but uh, he gave me the structure of my code. <laughs> you know, so I blatantly copied everything out of SIL. Um, one of the things you have, to, you have to remember is this is a tiny machine. I don't know where the one megabyte thing came from, because I think that was my 100K, uh, 128K bytes, which included the black and white bitmap display. And so, yeah. so they added more, but it was after I was gone. So what you ended up doing, for instance, the, one of the weird things about the display was you would set up display blocks and say, I want a display block starting at this scan line and over here, and it's got this many bits across, and you could have a link of a bunch of display blocks. So Icarus, for instance, in order to save memory, so we had the maximum amount of room for your drawing, we had several different display blocks, and when there was a white border around the edge of the screen, we just didn't draw anything there so that we could save those few bytes of memory so we could draw more rectangles in the, in the layout. The other thing you had to do was uh, get rid of the operating system because it was taking up most of the space. So there's my favorite call in the operating system was called Junta. So when you first started up the program, you would do a Junta to, to throw out as much of the operating system as you could afford. And then when you were done with your program, you'd call Counter Junta and have it put it back, right? Um, then, so what we did is, uh, the only thing I really used out of the operating system was a little bit of help on the display and the disk, disk uh, utilities. Uh, everything else, for instance, I was polling the keyboard and the mouse. So what I had at the bottom most level was a loop that would check to see if the user clicked a key, uh, check to see if the user had clicked a mouse button. Um, if not, I would draw a few rectangles um, and then go back and check again, right? And so what I would have is, a, is a, an area on the screen that I had blanked out because you'd made a modification and I was gradually filling it back in while I was polling uh, the mouse. Last thing I'll, I'll talk about is the uh, drawing speed. Um, we, did a, we did a few optimizations where we would, we had this long list, and we sorted all of the rectangles we had to draw by, by Y, and then we would run through them, and we'd keep a pointer into the list, which was the first one that ever got drawn the last time around since you changed your um, circuit. And that allowed us to very quickly kind of refresh. We also used BitBlit. For those of you who have, BitBlit was brand new, and it was, it was the Smalltalk guys, I think the Smalltalk guys were the one that came up with BitBlit. And so I borrowed their microcode implementation and, and called it from my BCPL in order to draw the rectangles. And one of the native modes of BitBlit is, here's a pattern, um, draw, it, draw this rectangular region and fill it with that pattern. So that's how we did all the uh, chip design layout kind of drawing. Want him to ask questions? Uh, let, let's save that for, uh, for later. Uh, the Alto, um, as a, as a uh, personal computer, was a modest performer at best. But as a microcomputer, it was actually quite respectable. And we did have the opportunity to uh, write custom microcode to accelerate um, things that, that, are, that are critical for performance. So when I was uh, uh, tasked with um, writing a, a general purpose server for our 60 page a minute printer, um, 
I was able to, uh, to, to, to exploit this by writing microcode that, that uh, greatly improved the page rendering, uh, which is the taking of a like, text, text page and turning it into the bits that are required to send to the printer. And that went from many seconds per page down to two pages a second for typical text pages. And by doing that, um, it better matched the speed of the printer and, and got a, co a user community that actually were willing to use the thing. Um, it, it occurred to me while, while thinking about this that I may have been also the only um, Alto programmer that, that had to exploit another means of saving memory, which was to do full um, uh, memory image swaps from the disk of both the server code and then the printing code because uh, despite all attempts to save memory, there really wasn't room in that machine for both uh, queuing service and, and, uh, and the actual uh, the hard, hardcore activities of printing a page. So that was a, a great deal of fun experience for me. Um, is this live? Yeah, it's live. I ended up doing almost everything on the Alto, so I, 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 I'm main designer of the Mesa programming language. Then I'm going to channel Alan Kay for a moment here. He said, if you've got a microcoded computer, the right way to do an instruction set is you take a byte that's the instruction and you just jump through a 256-way table in, in the microcode. And, th and that started what became the Java, be sorry, became the Mesa bytecodes, which later were the Java bytecodes, by the way. Um, uh, there's a direct path there. So then I helped implement that, and then they talked me into doing a file system written in Mesa, and I had to do firmware for the 2314 disks, big disks, and, and then actually build a file system. So that was sort of um, everything. But there, that, I did lots of other stuff, but that, that's kind of my Alto experience. The thing I wanted to back up about is the, the reason that the Park experience was so good then was we, were, we knew our customers really well because they were us. We built the things that we knew you had to have. We needed documents to do documentation. We needed design programs for doing circuit design and, and so on. Alan Kay knew he wanted to be doing animation and music and all kinds of things. And we built the stuff so that we could use it with the, in mind the mission from Xerox, which is they wanted to somehow figure out how to be more involved in the actual information in an office, not just copying bits on, on paper. But, but that led us, that, that vision of where we were going and what we were doing, if it seemed like a good thing for us to use, that was a reason to build it, right? Um, it's hard to do that so much these days in companies, but without that, I don't think we would have ever done the Alto and had all the success that it had had in terms of getting an industry started. <clears throat> do you want to show my pictures? Yeah, sure. Um, if you could. So my job at uh, Park was really to develop chips to do speech recognition, believe it or not. And I did a lot of work on chips. I did a lot of work on the chip development software. And, and when you get that up, turn it this way so I can see which slide to uh, mention. But uh, yeah, so I worked on the, the Icarus software to some extent. I worked on the multi-project chip system that built hundreds of chips from lots of universities and so on with the Mead and Conway design methods. Um, yeah. I got pictures here. I guess we're about to have display mode. Yeah, if you want to run through them for me. Next one is a picture of Lynn Conway sitting at an Alto. This, this was, she was my manager, and she built the LSI Systems Group, where, where Jim Rousen did Icarus, and we worked with Doug Fairburn on that. Next one is uh, Alan Bell sitting at an Alto. He's assembling a bunch of chips together. I don't know if this was with Icarus or another program that he uh, put together for that, because it doesn't look like Icarus. But this was in '79. Uh, the next one shows a picture of uh, what an Icarus screen layout looks like. This was one of the output pad structures that we put together into a big library of cells for people at universities to pick up and use to design their chips with. It shows these uh, stipple patterns that Jim was talking about that Bitblit is very good at taking a little 4x4 uh, four four pattern and replicating it in a rectangle, and that's how all these pictures were generated so quickly on this wimpy little machine. 
The next one uh, sort of duplicates the picture that Jeff showed of the cheat sheet for a mouse, this one for the, for the Icarus case. And in those days, the mouse buttons weren't left, middle, and right. They were red, yellow, and blue because they had these two different configurations, originally colored. I'm not sure I ever saw a colored one, but by the time I got there, uh, every, the, these horizontal buttons had mostly been phased out, and we only had the, the, the left, <coughs> left, middle, right configuration like you see now. The original mouse was a wheel mouse, and uh, these worked uh, particularly poorly, but they were mostly phased out by the time I got there as well. The, the ball mouse that uh, Jeff mentioned uh, was in the, the dead mouse and the live mouse box motivated a lot of my work toward the optical mouse. The next picture shows uh, what was also mentioned there was the, the, the color raster output printing. This was an actual laser printed document in 1978, believe it or not. We've reproduced this from the uh, Guide to LSI Implementation, a manual that uh, was put together by our summer employee, Bob Hahn, in 78, and shows some of the Icarus layout there. Next one is an Icarus drawing of the top-level layout of the optical mouse chip that I did in 1980. You've got to realize this is, a, this is a fairly complex chip. It's a few thousand transistors, and it's just hand-drawn. And we, we did all the logic out on paper, and we knew what we wanted it to do. We had no simulation, but um, Chuck Thacker was interested enough in this thing that he sat down with me and poured over the check plots for hours, checking every logic connection with the layout to make sure it would work. And he, in fact, found two minor errors, which if he had not found, wouldn't have worked. So Chuck Thacker gets uh, credit for making the first working optical mouse, too, by helping me debug it at, at the layout stage. Uh, I got a couple of photos here. We had a reunion in 2009 at my house. That's Bert Sutherland on the left. He was Lynn Conway's manager, head of the system sciences lab. We had this uh, interesting kind of uh, sometimes friendly collaboration, sometimes less friendly competition down the hall on the second floor at Park between the uh, computer science lab and the system science lab. And uh, yeah, I had a lot of friends down the hall, but things didn't always run smoothly between the groups. <laughs> Fortunately, they supported everyone with altos. That went well. Uh, Bob Hahn there is holding, a, holding the uh, VLSI design or Lambda magazine that Doug Fairburn started publishing about that time as well. And there's Jim Rousen and myself with short hair there. And another picture there is uh, roughly the same group but with Doug Fairburn in it. He's, uh, I don't know if he's here today or not, but he was uh, Jim's intern host in, in the LSI system he's at, group. He's at a wedding. He's photographing oh, a wedding today. He's at a wedding so today. Good. Uh, the next one is a document that I wrote as a term paper for a Stanford course that I took in 1978. This was produced in Bravo in kind of Xerox memo style. And if you, if you read this thing, it's, uh, it's kind of the roadmap for my career since then. For the last uh, 40 years, I've been working on uh, speech and hearing with auditory models and so forth. In fact, I left Xerox in 81 to head a group at uh, Schlumberger doing that kind of work. And it's recently come together uh, in my current deal at Google in the uh, form of a book, Human and Machine Hearing, that uh, you'll find almost everything in this book back in that 1978 term paper from Park. And the only reason I still have a copy of it is because I had written on the top there, Return to Dick Lyon. And when I, <laughs> so about 20 years ago, Rich Pasco found it among his uh, belongings and sent it back to me like it said it should. So I still have it. The next one is a figure out of that document that uh, shows a, uh, a sonogram of sound. That's me saying the word one. We, we managed to get equipment to actually get sound into the computer and analyze it through bandpass filter banks and plot it. This was all done with BCPL code on the Alto. That's about, about the most BCPL programming I ever did, and it, it wasn't much. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. All right, thanks. Oh, and the, and the optical mouse, I did that. So I was just going to mention uh, two things, Hanson, of my own program. And very early on, there were the first couple altos and an early Ethernet, uh, just connecting two machines with some clip leads. And um, we needed a little protocol to try to move files back and forth between two machines. And, um, and in the culture of the time, you sort of got you know, Tom Sawyer, where you're handing paintbrushes to everybody. And Bob Metcalf basically came and said, hey, you want to implement the other end of this protocol in Smalltalk? because it's always better to have two different environments, so you bring out the bugs. And it was a very simple one packet in flight. It was an Ethernet protocol. It wasn't even an internet protocol. Didn't know about more than one network. 
single packet in flight, no file names, really simple thing. And I went off to program this in Smalltalk. Well, Smalltalk is an interpreted higher level language where it could do some amazing things, but performance was never its strength, and fielding interrupts was never its strength, and computing CRCs over blocks of memory was never its strength. So doing this in, a, in an interpreted environment was a fool's errand, which I undertook for a while until I finally realized it was hopeless, and therefore I dropped down into some BCPL code to try to make the thing actually work. Then fast forward some years, we have the PUP internet, we have large systems, we have you know, hundreds of ethernets, and we were doing some more diagnostic work, and, and there's a wonderful paper on this that I had a chance to write, and I won't give you all the gory details, except the first worm program, which was able to reach through the network, capture some machines, run multi-machine programs, and in at least one case, killed them all and left them dead on everybody's desk the next morning. It was not one of my better days. <laughs> Can I, speaking of uh, malware, I did, uh, after I had left uh, Xerox, I was visiting folks at LRG when they were down the street one time, and uh, I told Ted Kaler how awful their security was and how I could like boot somebody else's machine remotely without even knowing their password and get their password and so forth. He said, no, you can't do that. I said, sure, whose password do you want? He said, Dave Boggs. So I said, you know, FTP Boggs retrieve Swati. And the machine gladly woke up and sent me the Swati file, which was the, the memory image from the last time he had crashed. And I searched it for Boggs, and the next thing after that was his password. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, you may have noticed they also didn't have security. We, we, that was a waste of time. We, we had things to do. Um, but we, there was also a thing where with one of the reasons we did Mesa and Smalltalk was the notion that if you programmed in those languages, you didn't need the security barriers that and that would be a lot cheaper because you weren't doing operating system calls. You're just doing, just doing normal procedure calls. And that was actually one of the great experiments of, at, at Park. I would say it, it didn't succeed, but it was a noble experiment at, at least. And we were able to build all this stuff in a cooperative environment to do that, but you wouldn't do it today. Lest people leave with the wrong impression. I mean, we knew when we started that security was not our, our top priority. But over time, let us not forget in the email environment, the, the work that was done on you know, being able to verify people's identity and have an authentication on your email. So, I mean, you, you have to remember, you know, this machine, 40 to 45 years old, those are the bits from 40 to 45 years ago that are running. And only a little bit after these bits, I guess it was Schroeder and Roger Needham and some others who did the authenticated email. I, I should know the exact names. And we had an environment where you got an email that, from, that said, it's from Jim Mitchell and it's been authenticated by this server. Or you got an email that claimed to be from Jim Mitchell and it is unauthenticated. So you've got to decide whether you want to trust this or not. So we had authentication for email 35 or 40 years ago. My life has never been that good since. And we still do not have decent authenticated email. You had to focus on it and make decisions and implement things. And it's another unbelievable missed opportunity. So although at moments we were pretty cavalier, I mean, there were passwords on the ethernet in the clear. I mean, you didn't need to go into a, a dump file. I, could, I had a program that I could gobble down everybody's password because to log into the timesharing system, they were in the clear. And I was like, no big deal. But when you chose, you made a decision that said this is important, you could build some unbelievably good stuff which got lost along the way. Must have been after I left. I never saw the authenticated email. If, if there's an alto-sized challenge for, uh, for the current day, it might be this security and malware issue. And um, I strongly regret that, that I and my colleagues at, across the country and across the world at the time um, were in an environment where those issues were dealt with mostly by, by understood trust. Uh, which is, of course, gone now. Um, it, it, it's not clear how in a world that's, that has this much uh, existing technology deployed, uh, one could take a real good cut at a technology solution to some of the major problems that face us 
uh, in, in our current network world. But uh, if you have any ideas, think about spending a lot of time working on them. Thanks. So um, do we have any other photographs that we want to show? Or um, we'll take some questions. All right. I remember you had a question. Wob him any. This is not staged. But I was wondering, you mentioned one thing about, I think you, sir, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Dick. Or John. Jim. John. John. John Shock. There was a virus that was made essentially back in the Alto. Mm -hmm. Because uh, my understanding was the first computer virus came out in the mid 80s, but I think you're saying that you had one that was by virtue of your own design. Well, so, so the, the, the question was about the first virus versus the first worm. And um, w one of the things they will teach you here at the Computer History Museum is the treachery of trying to apply the word first. Sure. That, you know, this, this is very complicated. So, but I, I will give you a little bit of the narrative. Cheers. Uh, there clearly were, if you define a virus as a piece of malware that's ta attached onto a piece of PC software on a disk and it's handed to somebody and it gets into their machine, those existed much earlier. Um, the particular thing that we built at Xerox was a machine to machine, we could call it a virus and I'll come back in a moment. And what really happened is we were, we were trying to prove to everybody and as part of my PhD thesis that the performance of an ethernet under heavy load worked really, really well, which people from IBM refused to believe. And so we spent one night walking around by hand with these disks, loading up 100 machines with a test program and controlling it from a central control point, but having to then go around and reboot the machines we were done. And having loaded 100 of them for a couple hours in the morning, we said, that's a really stupid idea. We're not doing that again. So we sat down and we devised a system to reach out and grab hold of a machine, cause it to do a net boot, gather those machines to run the test, so it would turn around and pound on the Ethernet. And we then use this to build some other applications. And so this is a program that goes from machine to machine, including second order and third order machines. A second machine could go after other machines. And we chose to call these multi-machine programs worms derived from a book called Shockwave Rider, which I commend to you and which has a thing called a tapeworm. Now, I know that these are the first worm programs because we named them the first worm programs. They're not the first multi-machine distributed computations. There are earlier programs, the Reaper, the Creeper, the ARPANET routing algorithms, and these are all described in a paper in the communications of the ACM. So, you know, I, I certainly am happy to take claim for having named the first worm, you know, who really wrote the first beneficial or malevolent machine-to-machine -machine program I'm not going to step into that. Well, I, th I think that was a great answer. I was just curious, particularly because uh, I was watching Stephen Hawking define uh, a computer virus as fitting the definition of a living system and being essentially a biological entity itself. So if indeed that's what you made, then you're essentially gods in your own right. And then the follow-up is uh, for Icarus, that's kind of a dangerous name for a uh, something flying too high to the sun, maybe? Or is it an acronym? I just wanted to ask about that. And then Icarus 2 must have been the one that had wings that were redone. So, minor story, um, Carver Mead named the program, um, and it's actually an acronym. It stands for Integrated Circuit Artwork Utility System. Okay. I didn't come up with a name, Carver did. I added a minor fallout, MIT, some guys at MIT uh, built a uh, constraint-based layout system called Daedalus, directly inspired by Icarus that they were trying to say would be better than Icarus because it wouldn't flame out, so. Yeah, but I think we had way more users than Daedalus had, but that's okay. All right. Just uh, two questions, one simple one, one a little more involved. Uh, how many current Alto systems are in working such as that in the world? 
and the second one is a little more complex, is that the, the bitmap display, whose idea was it, and who actually made the, um, the display itself? So, wait, so your first question is how many Alto systems currently run, just like this one? Um, well, I know of at least three, actually four. There's this one, uh, the museum we ourselves have restored two, and the Living Computer Museum has restored one. So that's at least four um, that I know of. There may be others, but uh, I'm not, if so I'm not aware of them. Five? Five? Okay, five. Uh, yeah, so the last one question is, is whose idea was to do a bitmap display, and where was the... Uh, did special hardware, i.e. The, the, the display itself, have to be manufactured specially to support that? Shall I take the first stab at some of at our, So I, I, I don't know where all the bodies are buried. So again, some of the context, you know, in, in this era, before bitmap displays, you had vector drawing systems that, you know, were used in Sketchpad and other places that had CRTs, and, and you had a display list, and... You know the the problem was if the image was too complicated, you couldn't move the 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 electron beam around and refresh it fast enough so you'd start to get flicker, particularly if you were trying to do text because you had a lot of text. So there's there's that problem. There were bitmap display terminals that had raster scan, but they were generating the bits on the fly from a text representation and a very simple five by seven font. So you didn't, you know, it's a bitmap sort of, it's a raster scan, but it didn't have a complete bitmap behind it. Um, now, I, I don't know all of the history, but I know in, in, in my experience, the first place we really saw it was in this machine called the RCG, which was the Research Character Generator. And it was used in building the prototype of the Polos office system, which predated the Alto. And it had an unusual high-performance configuration. It had a font memory. It was designed to do characters, but much higher resolution. So it had a pile of font memory, and then it had characters. And on the fly, it would read the characters and much, have much higher resolution of the font. But, and therefore, it had a pile of memory, and it had a whole rack, and it was really expensive. And it was a research prototype. But it had all this memory. This is at Xerox Park. So, and this was the research character generator to support the Park Online Office System, which was a separate project which actually came before, which, by the way, designed the casework, the, the, the keyboard, and the mouse. A lot of it came from Polos, which, which was meant to be a derivative of the SRI NLS system in that it had a centralized computing farm with data general novas with video that was going to come out to the terminals. So it wasn't this kind of system, but the RCG had this memory to experiment with it. Well, somebody had the great idea, and I don't know who, is that you'd put in the character memory, the text memory, the full ASCII set from 0 to 255 lined up properly, and then the font memory all of a sudden became a bitmap. And therefore, the way you wrote the bits into the bitmap to display them on the screen was to write into the font memory A through Z, although it's really ASCII 0 through ASCII 256 or whatever, and you sort of contort the bits in the font memory into about a quarter of a frame. And that's what was used for the Cookie Monster animation, the original one. I did some stuff, I programmed that in the Nova in Algol. We had some graphic stuff. I did a Ladeen character recognizer, which is not particularly brilliant. It's in the appendix to the Newman and Sproul book. Um, but you could use the mouse and you do it. It's, it's like um, graffiti or whatever it was. So it's a stroke recognizer. And I discovered in the math package, oh shit, I don't remember, what it was take a hyperbolic cosine to do a catenary. So I said, I'm gonna hang catenaries in this graphic. So in the bitmap, you have two points in the length of the catenary, it's the, the shape of a chain when it hangs. So we were doing early graphic stuff on the bitmap in the font memory of the RCG system. So and John, then finally the idea came along that said, you know, 1103 memories, you know, what were they, a tenth to a penny a bit, so I don't know, it's 20 or 30K, you can have enough to do a full page, and that's where you get to the Alto. Now, maybe some other guys can fill in pieces here. So, uh, I had a different question about the RCG. Didn't the RCG end up as the font memory for ears? Uh, yes, so the R RCG, so ears... The, so, the, the first laser printing engine 
which is what you worked on with Gary Starkweather, thank you, is the slot, scanning laser output terminal, which I saw in the summer of 71, and all it produced was graph paper, which was amazing, by the way, but it had, all it had was a signal generator, something to do graph paper. To get a print server, you build EARS, which is a nested acronym that includes E was the Ethernet, A was the Alto, E A. R was the research character generator, which you need to generate the bits on the fly, and S was slot, the scanning laser output terminal. So you put those four pieces together, and you get the world's first print server, which included the RCG. Or a I'm not sure if it was the original one or a derivative, but yeah. I think it was the original. It might have been the original. Yeah, yeah the, the, the ears to drive the first laser printer was the RCG with, I think, one or two cards changed, and that was, that was basically all Bob Sproul. Um, uh, worked on that. I still remember having a conversation with Chuck Thacker in the, when, when we were still discussing the design of the Alto, and I asked him about the display idea, and he said, everybody I talk to has a different idea about what they want to do with the display, and so I'm a physicist, I'm going to do the simplest mechanism that will allow anything to happen and leave all policy to software, and that is, I will read the bits out of memory and raster scan them onto the screen. It's your job to put the right bits in, in memory. And I'm sorry, you asked one other question. The, um, I don't quite know who did which part. It's a Ball Brothers monitor, Clinton did some part of it, and Clement Labs did the industrial design and manufacturing of the early monitor cases, which were supposed to be for Polos, and which were then adopted with, I think, some slightly different interfaces on the monitor that evolved into the Alto display. Yeah, Clement Labs was here somewhere in the, in the, in the valley, yeah. So, I guess we'll take one last question. The last question. Hi, uh, during the time that you were at Park, was there any frustration or anger that you felt towards Xerox management for not <laughs> using the technology to, to a greater purpose? Yes. <laughs> well, you know, there was a great diaspora out of Park around 83, starting in 83, and it was directly related to that issue. Um, Many people had tried to get Xerox interested. One of the problems that Park had was we were an outpost. All of Xerox was back east. They, all the money came from copiers. Trying to get those folks to appreciate these kids. We were kids living in an ivory tower as far as they were concerned. And the honest, the, that, that problem was a big, was a big problem. Uh, also, no one understood the market in those days. We did build an, a system development corporation and make commercial products, but they were too expensive. And if there was a bit of genius in what Steve Jobs did, it was he figured out how to do a Macintosh for $3,000, right? And Xerox didn't have, we didn't have, we, we were marketing poor at Park. So a little more on that. Uh, Xerox chose as its business model to emulate IBM. And IBM built systems for business and systems that were expensive but could be leased. And that was the model that we pursued. It turned out that IBM itself destroyed that business model when they put together the IBM PC and specifically decided to do a product that broke their own business model. And so maybe Xerox would have succeeded if IBM hadn't, if IBM had followed their own rules. It's, it's all very interesting. Long before Xerox did the uh, system development division to develop the D machines for the star office and so forth, what I remember is the, uh, there was an office products division in Dallas, if I'm remembering right, and they, we talked to them about multifunction software controlled machines, and they really wanted to sell single function hardware optimized machines because that's what copier salesmen could get their heads around. Although, 
those machines were actually uh, processor-driven machines that had a fixed ROM program in them yeah. that they could have replaced with RAM. It's okay if there was a computer buried inside, as long as you didn't know it, right? Yeah. All right, so that wraps up our panel. Thank you very much.